LB RIP QE2. My Big goodness. day. My Big goodness. day. Especially for your people. Especially although my grandmother famously hated her. But hated loved her. the family. Loved the uh, the others, yes. Like her dad and stuff, Like right? her dad, yep. Like the Wally Simpson guy. Is that her dad? No. That's she, a bad one. She, oh, no, no. She liked that one. She liked all... He was like a Nazi sympathizer. You didn't marry into a perfect family, Alice. <laughs> Maybe I should have been full disclosure on some of this stuff. Most of us fought for the Allies. I couldn't tell you that. Just feel, take heart in that. Um, so here is, um, here is, um, okay. So today I'm going to tell you a little personal story today, Alice. Okay. Uh, it was a very good day for me. How so? Just I had a couple of interviews that I was looking forward to. I didn't know why I would handle them. Tommy Davidson. It was one. He's the guy from In Living Color from the 90s. And he, he's been in a thousand million things since. And he's doing stand-up. He's just a very different cat than Tom Shattuck. You know, this is a guy who is a... a interesting story. He's a guy who... Um, you know, he's he's been a comedian like... Like, um, you know, devotee of Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor from that kind of... Mm-hmm. That kind of influence, etc. You know, made it big in with in Living Color and in movies, etc. Out in L.A. was an Ace Ventura too. Just been in such. <laughs> and and anyway, he's just like he just travels in different lanes than I ever ha- had. He's also he's a black guy who was literally thrown away by his mother, his biological mother. Hmm. He was discarded like in the trash. Wow. And was found by somebody. And a white family adopted him, hmm. and then brought him up <clears throat> first in the um, in um, a suburb of D.C. where the black kids were horrible to him. I'm sorry, urban near D.C. Black kids were horrible to him because he had white parents. Mm-hmm. And then he moved, and then um, he started getting crap from some white kids because he was a black. Anyway. His whole life story is not a sob tale. He's got a totally optimistic attitude. Hmm. But, I mean, he overcame just a lot in this incredible... And it's, it's just listening to him. He was trying to... He busted his rear end in in doing comedy stand-up. You know, because the idea is to make a living. Moves to L.A. where he gets there and there's no gigs, no nothing. He's going to start from the bottom. And the gods around there at that time... When he was ever like Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey was a big James Carrey, was a big um, headliner at the Comedy Store, and uh, he had trouble even getting in there. But then got in, and then worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And then you know, um, right as he was about to quit, they asked him to essentially not headline, but be in the big stage there. And they ended up then later with in between Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor on a set. I mean, in a on a night when he's performing <clears throat> and then he got all sorts of offers and and like rejected a few of them and then no offers and he was like it's just a roller coaster ride then he got in living color um and then it was off to the races from there and but it was interesting like i was watching it I, to see i was watching i don't think i have it open i i i, I wouldn't even want to play it and living color was so cutting edge that there was a skit that he was in Mm-hmm. He was a kid named uh, Calvin. Okay. So the skit is there. Alan Thick had a TV show for a brief time in the nineties. You know Alan Thick? Yeah, from Growing Pains. Right. The, the father. Well, he had a, a variety show, like um, like Carson did for for a while. Everybody did in the late eighties, early nineties. Mm. And Alan. And so Jim Carrey plays Alan Thick, and he says Jim Carrey plays Alan Thick. And he says, hi, everybody. I, uh, and he's, he's coming off like super geeky white guy kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And he says, I want to bring in the like the, the woman who runs the, the San Diego Zoo, Joan Emery. And Joan Emery was a woman, a zoo woman, who, who, who usually bring exotic animals on. Mm-hmm. This time, she's got a kind of a, a, str- a hood kid, hip hop kind of kid, who's Tommy Davidson's character, Calvin. That's the animal she's bringing in. Yeah, that's, like, not okay. <laughs> no. Can you imagine this? No. And, of course, the whole point is 
that she, of course, is just completely... Jim Carrey is saying, like, what? tell me about it. Does it speak? Does it, it's totally... It's, oh, it is so unallowable. It's so wrong in so many ways. But really, but they're, they laugh. They're poking fun of the prudish, you know, lily white lady who's like uh, the zoo handler at the Jim Carrey, who's the empty sold uh, or, or Alan Thicke, or the empty sold presenter, you know, who's uh, who's really charmed by this. And the kids got a bad attitude. Tommy Davidson has a bad attitude and is like threatening these guys. Like it really is. It's really insulting to every group rep- represented. Mm-hmm. And it's like just so incredible. And I talked to him about that. And uh, and like you, there's no way you, you, there, that can't happen at all. You cannot have that. Oh, yeah. Uh, right no, but it was so healthy and good that we did have it then. Nobody afraid to joke. They weren't. The, the point of the skit was not that, that black kids from the hood were animals. The point of the, the skit was that many white people had no idea what, you know, it, it, really right now it would be talking about um, progressive moms in, in New Haven, people with Black Lives Matter yard signs, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like treating people, treating people like these accessories, etc. And it was just so, it was, it was, it was so good and so freaking wrong. It, but, and, I, and I miss it. And I told him that today. That I miss that kind of stuff, and and then I get, I get a call. Tim and Canton called him, and he reminded me that they had a guy, another performer, who played a guy named Handyman. Handyman, I'm afraid. Yes, <laughs> was a severely physically disabled superhero, which takes spoofs somebody with severe disabilities. As <laughs> it is so wrong, that was done by um, I think Keenan Ivory Wayans or Damon Wayans, one of the brothers mm-hmm. who the Wayans brothers were involved yeah, in. Yeah. And this show, damn it, and this is why I wanted to have Tommy Davidson on because talking to somebody from like the safe, the old days, and and that's why I, when I say it, I think the race relations were better 35 years ago, I think they were, I think they were absolutely enjoying the hell out of dressing people, mocking people, having fun at the expense of people across racial lines, across, and everybody loved it. That, that, and it got a lot of black people very rich. Oh, no doubt Not about that. Coincidentally. It, it, it got, what it did is get a lot of black people who nobody had heard of before, like Tommy Davidson and David Allen Greer and the Wayans brothers and others who were on there. It got them to be beloved by little white kids in suburbs who would never have known who they are who love these guys mm-hmm. like i have and i would told my friend jay and dana you know my friends i told them because like for our generation everybody loves tommy davidson it's the thing mm-hmm. everybody loves him you know it generally so so anyway so that's why it's like he's one of the guys who was there when that was like when you could do things and say things and i just i just i loved talking to him and you know what yeah. i loved most and obviously i was i think that a lot of times, I, I I assume that these a lot of these people that I interview, especially if I'm re- into it, mm-hmm. I assume that they think that one either I'm somebody who's a special case, <laughs> or that I might be just absolutely flying high on cocaine because I get very giddy and over the top. But listen to this, Alice. I'm not okay. going to pat my own back here whatsoever. But here is my goodbye to Tommy with Tommy Davidson. All right. Um, and two shows on Saturday as well. So these tickets won't last. You can call 860-530-6541. Or I'll, I'll, we'll throw the link of Comics Roadhouse at Mohegan Sun up there. You are an extraordinary guy, um, Tommy Davidson. And I'm going to read your book that you wrote. Okay, and um, thank you really so right. much for coming on and joining us. Ah, man, you got it. Great questions. I haven't had an interview like that in a long time. With somebody actually asked me about myself. Appreciate well, I, I, I appreciate the kind words. Take care, man. Did you hear that? You actually asked him about himself. I sure did, because I was very interested. I was really locked in today. And I had Paul Reiser on today, too, who was just as nice as could be, just as, absolutely as nice as can be. So I and, and so this is t- this was this is why I'm celebrating myself today is because, you know, I do generally a hard news show, not hard news, but a hard news opinion show anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. 
So I started the show uh, in six minutes later. Was talking to Paul Reiser, which you know blows the show apart. You know, you, you, there's no you can't do you know you can't like you can't switch back and forth between right. politics and. And that then once scene. I started getting going, it was time for Tommy Davidson, and I got through these two interviews. And those guys are in probably Paul Reiser is a bigger marquee name because uh, he's he's just been in a lot of hit movies and and a, a hit TV show. You know, you don't know Mad About You, but it was. It was the older, in mid thirties to early forties, uh, apartment version of Friends Seinfeld. Hmm. It was it was the standard, and it was always a big hit as well. And then he, anyway, he's just a great. So I'm happy because one of these days, I'm happy that I got to have these interviews and I was engaged, and I think they went off well today. I'm happy because once again, I have the radio show and the mic. And I'm talking to these people. And some of these these people are kind of extraordinary. They've done extraordinary things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like some of the politicians or other people I speak to. But sometimes it's just good to know that I the like self-realization that, wow, you know what? I really don't know what I'm doing at all. They probably shouldn't be letting me talk for this <laughs> on this route. You know I mean? It's just good to know that they, like that doesn't happen uh, generally. And it all comes together. And especially in a time when... When I was, uh, you know, hoping to have uh, my faculties and things like that. So that's it. So I'm giddy about that. And that's all you need to know. It's a very happy and giddy thing. And then I had Dick Morris on, which was great. You know Dick Morris? <laughs> yes, I know who he Who's is. Who's just, uh, you know, he's such an operator. He's always up to something. It's very refreshing to have him on. <laughs> he's, he mentions his book title, Every Seven Words. He pretends he listens to the show constantly. But then at some point he told the producer, so I'm on with Tim, right? And like, <laughs> <that's> like, <laughs> which he said yes. Uh, but I like him. I like he, he thinks Hillary's going to run. He's sure of it, as a matter of fact. Oh yeah, he's been saying that. I, I mean, I think a lot of people think Hillary's going to run. I think Hillary thinks Hillary's going to run. She's putting stuff out there. Yeah. Like, the second Biden got COVID, she was like tweeting a picture of herself on Air Force One. Like, uh, what are you doing, lady? Like, it just. I I definitely think she's running. You know, especially because on the left, she gets so much love now for having been the person who went down to Donald Trump and should have won. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. like, she gets all this, like, fangirling that she never would have gotten. Like, nobody was that excited about Hillary Clinton until she lost to Donald Trump. I mean, really, until she was running against Donald Trump. That's when, like, the sort of pantsuit mythology kind of came about i mean i realized that in the early 90s there was this sort of thing that she was awesome and great too like the what did what was it like two for the price of one or they were saying that you were well getting like- yeah although she she started to drag him down they had to do it she was she they had to do an emergency the, the pretty and pink interview was done to have america refall in love with hillary because mm-hmm. people didn't like. I mean, her, she had huge these huge grant. First of all, she was salty on interviews about the about the women that Bill was sleeping with and all the the vast right wing conspiracy stuff. And she was very interested. She was she was it was two for the price of one because she was very interested in <clears throat> everything that Bill was doing. People would have to go through her a lot. She was she was a smart political mind to have around, and she asserted herself. And plus, he had liabilities, and you know, yeah. So, well, but this sort of like hero worship of her now, like we should have had Hillary Clinton sort of mindset on the left is like that she's the woman who should have been there. And I think especially after this latest crop of Democrats were so bad, it's just sort of. You know, she's sort of back to being the heir apparent of this whole thing because it's like, who are you going to run? You can't. It, Biden is out of the question. Kamala, like oh, Pete. You know, I, I think as far as Hillary Clinton is concerned, she feels like she's better than all those people, and she's probably a better politician than most of those people. Do you think so? Better than well, Kamala I mean, or b- Pete? Better than uh, like uh, Julian Castro or yeah, in in Beto, for God's sake. <laughs> who do the Democrats- like everyone? When when debate one happened and they all started speaking Spanish in their answers, you knew that we had a problem here. Ugh. Oh, how pathetic! Oh, how pathetic! Yeah. So and then Biden would cede his time back, and then Warren I, Warren repulses people. I I believe she does. She also comes across like somebody who's insane. 
Mm -hmm. And this thing, like, the the worst thing that an insane fake person can do is try (laughs) to act real. So when she's like, hi, Bruce, I think I'll have myself a beer. Can I get you a beer, Bruce? (laughs) <laughs> no, thank you. I'm fine. I do not need a beer. And it's like, okay. Well, yeah, that's why I think, like, people still, I know the left doesn't, but people still kind of like Ted Cruz because he kind of embraces his oddballness because he's an odd guy, you know, but but people still kind of do like him. And and I think that he's also socially awkward and weird, but, but he still comes across as likable because he's not trying to pretend to be Mr. Cruz cool guy on the block but yeah i mean it the the left has a dearth of serious politicians right now that are you know capable of running in a serious way i so i think hillary clinton is in a way right to feel that she could do better than these idiots i i think that if she gets in she definitely would be the person to beat and i So, I don't know. It's interesting. I was struck by something else you said, too. This is totally switching gears. But I was thinking about the um, how you were talking about how when you were a kid or a young person, everybody loved (coughs) Tommy Davidson. Yeah. And it wasn't, like, because he was black or in spite of the fact that he was black or any. Like, you guys just loved him because he was funny and interesting and doing cool stuff. And, like, that was it. Very inspiring. The the whole... Cool. And I think there's a lot of people like that in pop culture. I think, like, Will Smith, I think, for, like, kids my age, like, Michael Jordan. Like, everybody loved Michael Jordan. Nobody didn't love Michael Jordan. You know? It, there, yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. And there's the, just, like... And actually, Will Smith, you know, he was, even when I was a kid, mm-hmm. not a kid, but a teenager, that's when his song came out. Mm-hmm. And, like, it was, I mean, I was probably only 13 or 14 or whatever. It, the parents just don't understand. And that was, like mind-blowing and so cool and so he was like instantly cool you're right yeah and it's so funny to contrast that world that we grew up in that's not that long ago i mean like all the people from that world are still alive and here with us right it's so funny to contrast that world with now the way hollywood and the left act about black people in movies and pop culture as though, like, everyone's racist towards them. Yeah, Like, yeah. I'm thinking of the Lord of the Rings stuff. It's so funny. Like, how can you square this pop cultural moment? So, like, the, we talked a little about this new Lord... Um, what's the thing called? Rings of Power on Prime, right? And they've decided that the reason everybody's slamming it is because there's black elves in it. Which isn't the reason why everyone's slamming it. They just don't think it's good. So, they came out with this tweet. We stand in solidarity with our cast. Hashtag, you are all welcome here. Statement. We, the cast of Rings of Power, stand together in absolute solidarity and against the relentless racism, threats, harassment, and abuse some of our castmates of color are being subjected to on a daily basis. We refuse to ignore it or tolerate it. How can this happen in the same world where, like, Will Smith and all these people are still in Hollywood? I don't understand it's so it's so petty and small it's so it's such bad such a bad look it's so weak looking our world has never been all white fantasy has never been all white middle earth is not all white bipoc belong in middle earth and they are here to stay Finally, all our love and fellowship go out to the fans supporting us, especially fans of color, who are themselves being attacked simply for existing in this fandom. We see you, your bravery and endless creativity, your cosplays, fan cams, fan art, and insights make this community a richer place and remind us of our purpose. You are valid, you are loved, and you belong. You are an integral part of the Loader family. Thanks for having our backs. Like and then the first right in the comments, the official Star Wars account is tweeting from Middle Earth to a galaxy far, far away. Hashtag you are all welcome here. Like how can people pretend I mean it, did Lando not happen? <laughs> like what is the official Star Wars account doing right now? Like do they not know that there was a black character in the original Star Wars that was totally accepted and beloved like 30 years ago or 40 years ago or whatever it is now? 
Are they unaware of that? Because I don't understand this thing. Like, for too long, black people have been excluded from Star Wars. Like, what is that supposed to mean? I, it's so insane to me. It's such insane behavior. Hollywood has been one of the places where black people are most accepted and where people have absolutely accepted seeing people of color and appreciating the talents of people of color all over the place. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. So why is Hollywood doing this weird gaslighting <laughs> now? Like, you just don't like the movie because there's uh, black I, people I, I, in it. At some point, they, 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 I think, I mean, I, this is just old trodden grass. At some point, the equity crew came in and said, so yeah, th that's fine. You you had Will Smith in Independence Day and fine. You had uh, Carl Weathers as um, Apollo Creed in the Rocky movies, but it's not equitable. That's why Oscar is so white. There's still mostly white people are winning all these. So, and so they want to, it, it, whatever. It's freaking pathetic. It's such poor sportsmanship, such crybaby attitude. Who cares who wins? The freaking Oscar is won by a piece of crap movie almost every year. You know, you could have given it to I'm going to get you, Saka, in 1988 uh, with the Waynes brothers. You could have, you know, you could have given it to uh, Ace Ventura 2 if you wanted to. You know, you can, there's plenty of movies, and it's such a gross club of people, the Hollywood types. I do want their houses, but I, other than that, they're just freaking gross. Like the Jennifer Lawrence thing. What is this? What is this? You're talking about the, the wage disparity, and yeah, I'm a rich bitch too, I know. Yeah, yes, well, go ahead. Start redistributing right there. You can change this right there. You, oh, yeah. You can do the work right Once now, Once I Jen. became really rich, I realized that, like, we should totally give stuff away to poor people. Right. And when she says we, she means us. Yeah, not her. Right. Because she's this free is... to give stuff away to poor people why, right now. That's why they're so gross. They win their Oscars and they give speeches about what we all have to do. The people outside of Hollywood. How we need to get better at things. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, my God. You guys are such... Just gross, freaking, you know, lecturing know-nothings. But it's so disingenuous from, like, you know, one of the most diverse industries in the country for them to turn around and lecture us about how, like, you didn't appreciate our show because you just don't like black people. Like, what? What are you talking about? This country loves black people. Like, they're... They do. They love them. I completely agree. In in lots of in in many many contexts. I mean, yes, there are ways in which this country has abandoned black people, like in lots of um, urban environments, to crime and bad schools and abusive politicians that are destroying the infrastructure. I mean, yeah, there there are ways in which black people suffer in this country, but in terms of like pop culture and Hollywood and stuff, like you're going to sit here and tell me that Americans don't like movies with black people in them with a straight face? Right. Like I mean we've all been here in the same place. Like don't make excuses. And they're going through and deleting all these bad reviews for the show. Even though most of them have nothing to do with black people at all, like because it's review bombing, they just don't like black people. That's why well, they gave us a bad it's so, review. It's so gross, and it's like you said, it's it's dumb white people who are responsible for this elites, and like so twelve years after this country votes in a black man to be the leader of the free world. Mm -hmm. To be the head of the executive branch of the United States government, the most powerful man in the world. Twelve years later, that's when we all need to have a racial reckoning. Mm -hmm. Like, what the frig do you need at this point? Yeah, if you listen to these woke idiots, you would think this is like the most racist the country's ever been in its history. Like, more racist than when there was actual slavery. Oh, they think so because of social media. Because they saw the George Floyd thing on, on Twitter and TikTok. And that's the only place they look for anything. You know, they're not going to go look up any crime stats. The Washington Post keeps crime stats on, on the, the police, you know, crime stats and shootings, etc. Mm -hmm. But nobody cares to look. The The dream, the fantasy is more appealing. It lets people feel like activists and it lets politicians be be opportunists and lets dirtbags be dirtbags and it lets shakedown artists be shakedown artists. And so that's what we're doing because we're, we suck and we're stupid as a society and we need to be nuked. That's my, my whole feeling. 
Um, what else is going on, homie? I mean, you may need to be on one of my weekend 180 spots, Alice. I got to do okay. a, whole, a slew more of spots tomorrow. That's exciting. That's right. Um, so I keep seeing these articles like they just don't stop about quiet quitting. Have you followed yeah, this? Yes, trend? I have. I have. I've seen it. So today, the one I saw was like signs that you might be getting quiet fired. <laughs> That's great. Like the opposite. But I've also seen like woke takes about like how women and people of color can't afford to quiet quit. Um, you know, because they have to work like twice as hard for half the pay. So quiet quitting, if you don't know, is it's just a fancy way of saying uh slacking at work, basically. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> it's not something new that anybody invented. A lot of people have yeah, been but slacking it's, it's at now, work. But, for but now they're years. trying to construct it into a virtue. Right. Right. So the idea being that well, you, like, Todd had this great audio of this kid named Hunter, mm-hmm. who was a quiet quitter, who said, "I'm not going to literally die for my company." <laughs> oh no! He said, "Literally kill myself at my job for a company that doesn't love me." <laughs> for a company that doesn't love me, that's what we're dealing with here. He needs the company to love him, or else he's not going to uh, try, <laughs> literally kill himself. For the job. Yeah. Well, here's the problem with that is that there are people out there who will kill themselves at a lot of jobs. If the company is a good company to work for and all that stuff and paying you well and all those things, right? So, and I guess the argument is sort of like, well, if they're not paying me that well or not treating me right, like I'm just going to do whatever. But it's also not an original concept, as I'm sure all of us know, because we've worked with a lot of people who quiet quit before that was a thing. There are a lot of people out there not doing a good job at their jobs and slacking off and being lazy. And other people are picking up the slack for them. But the thing is, everybody around you knows that you're doing that. It's not just women and people of color who can't afford to quiet quit. It's really not recommended for your uh, career prospects for anybody of any color or creed. Right? But yeah. But they are casting it as a virtue. They're saying like, you know, this is a way to announce my independence from my work but yeah so that today i saw an article that was like how to tell if you're being quiet fired right (sighs) which means like when your work is like slowly trying to get you to quit which was already like a hostile workplace was already Mm -hmm. a, a thing so i just think it's funny that like gen z has to act like they invented everything completely fresh and new when it's not but this like trend about talking about quiet quitting won't go away you know but i don't know i i I think most workplaces know who's working hard and who's not don't you oh of course of course especially when these when these idiots can't keep off tiktok about it absolutely but this idea that first of all and I've noticed this with younger or older millennials, too, when I was managing just, you know, seven years ago. This feeling that they have to that they have to air if they're not feeling good about something or not feeling right or feel uneasy or don't feel appreciated, you know, mm-hmm. and pouting and just. Shut up and do the job. Get, this is like, what are you, is, is everybody an only child now? It's like, did your mom and dad not finish cooking you? It's like, why are you coming here for for emotional validation? Just go do wh- whatever you have to do. Mm-hmm. It's so it's so pathetic. It's so pathetic. I read something interesting the other day. It was like a quote from somebody, but talking about how um, these younger generations often didn't grow up um, involved with or seeing up close their parents working. Huh. You know that the that the parents would like leave the house and go do some other job outside and like most of the time the kids spent with their parents which is like your really formative time because it's your parents that you're trying to imitate in the world is like entertainment time fun time relaxing time so that's like your impression of what to be so they don't know like because if you're like 
cleaning the house with your kids tagging along behind you, they're like learning to clean the house. Or you see like how, because we're doing the podcast all the time, like our kids always want to be in here and talking on the microphones and doing stuff. But if the only things you do with your kids aren't work, if the only things you do with your kids are, you know, entertainment and going out and stuff, then like that's what they're going to learn from you is the way to be in life. Which I thought was like a really interesting point because I think that is like a big thing with younger people is that they don't, and this is obviously a huge generalization because there's plenty of younger people who have phenomenal careers and do amazing things. But anyway, but I think that like this sort of attitude that people recognize in the quiet quitters and the unworkers and all these different people is that they are they feel entitled and they don't understand why they would work or why they would, you know, put a hundred percent effort into a job or something, you know, they don't know why they're there and they don't feel like any sense of accomplishment or purpose. Right. What are you laughing about? Uh, Stephen Miller just tweeted, just told my 10 year old about Queen Elizabeth Hashtag Queen Elizabeth. She had tears in her eyes, and then she did the Wakanda pose and said, Liz Conda forever, which is the sort of pop culture crossover that I can celebrate. <laughs> what else is going on? <sighs> you know what's funny is... What's funny? So Wes Lowry tweeted out, and there's been a few mm -hmm. of these. The death, the, He's a former Globe guy. He's a, he's a fraud. But the death of a person seen as, near, as a near deity by the white political ruling and media class, but who has also, at one point the oppressive ruler of something like 30% of the global population is going to provide an excellent sample of the subjectivity of straight news reporting. God, really? Oh, my goodness. She was racist? Oh, my goodness. Yay. And this other idiot who I tw tweeted to us, or you might have tweeted to us too, said, oh, you know, I hope she's dying in pain right now because of all the racism that happened under the British crown. Yeah, Twitter took that one down. Actually. Oh, did they? Yeah. So, I know. think because... Bezos tweeted it and criticized it. I think they were nervous to do anything about it. Andrew Sullivan has a nice tweet on this that I kind of appreciate. He said, I'm trying to write a column and I find myself in tears. I fear that everything she exemplified, restraint, duty, grace, reticence, persistence, are disappearing from the world. I think he's right. Although I'm not going to cry. We're, we're, yeah, I mean, I think this is ultimately... She lived... I mean, this is a person who was not a free person. No. She lived a life of servitude. I understand she had su sweet rides and uh, awesome Castles houses. Castles and all things. And a lot of pomp and circumstance. I guarantee you by the time she was 16, she was over it. You know, this mm -hmm. is a person who was always going to functions, always doing things, always. I mean, that I would not want and that And did life. not complain like no. Meghan Markle. And no. And did not. Cause it's, I'm expected to do this. Somebody said something rude about my son's potential skin right. color or whatever. <clears throat> like, uh, it's so interesting to me that the left hates the monarchy and is so willing to trash it. Meghan Markle and now Harry included, right? And they're like, not a fan of kings and queens. And like, there's all the comments like, you know, we fought a war so we don't have to care about this stuff. Like, okay, guys, we get it. But the truth is that, like you say, the monarchy represents duty and family and patriotism and tradition and carrying on a culture and passing it down to another generation, which is all stuff that the left hates. They hate that. That's why they hate it. It's not about, you know, the American Revolution. I mean, the, the Americans who were here debated whether or not they should potentially have a monarch here, too. You know, and I, I can't say necessarily that all of our recent presidents have exactly been, like, total winners. You know, it's... I would say the jury's still out on which actually produces a better society, right? So did you read that thing about podcast movement? Was that on the air or was that before the show today? So I read you that yesterday before the show and we didn't get to it. We did read the thing, the original thing. Right. Um, and these are the guys who, when, because Westwood won, 
had a booth at the podcast movement um, convention. Shapiro well, actually, was, yeah, it was actually a Daily Caller booth, but they are oh, they're distributed by Cumulus Media, and Cumulus is a huge sponsor and, of the podcast movement. But conference. Cumulus Media also runs Westwood One, which runs Shapiro's radio show. Right. So they distribute all the Daily Caller. So he content. decided to get mm-hmm. over there and just check them out because he was in town, and so they put out a huge apology. So then mm-hmm. Cumulus now pulled their sponsorship from Podcast Movement. And now Podcast Movement has re- tweeted again since their sponsorship is gone. I actually am now starting to like these guys. As we stated, we're continuing to evaluate our policies guiding social media and events with inclusivity, diversity, and respect for all. We have to start by sincerely apologizing to Mr. Shapiro for our reaction when he visited a booth we sold his company. That wasn't right. <laughs> I like to see them, you know, careening from side to side, <laughs> just trying to figure out the right possible wokest thing to do. Well, right. And this, I think, this is actually, like, a weirdly encouraging sign. Now, I realize that Cumulus slash Westwood One um, make a lot of money from the Daily Caller and Ben Shapiro, so they obviously have an interest in this. But the fact that they're striking back against this stuff, so this was what they had said um, this was from Talkers Magazine, right? So we read you about this incident originally when they got all upset and apologized because Ben Shapiro appeared at a podcasting conference, one of the biggest podcasters in the world. Um, uh, let's see. So Washington... Uh, according to the Washington Examiner, one attendee tweeted, Hey, podcast movement, what the F? As a trans person, as a queer person, as someone with a uterus, this does not make me feel welcome. And so that's why they like went and apologized. That's all they needed. And yep. So they took down the tweets. But what Cumulus said... On Tuesday was at Cumulus Media, our tenant is that every voice matters and we support conferences and trade events where differing political viewpoints can be expressed and received with respect. As such, we were dismayed and disappointed by podcast movements handling of the reaction to our partner, top podcaster and conservative talk leader Ben Shapiro's mere presence at podcast movement. After giving the leaders of podcast movement sufficient time to appropriately address their misstep, we are disassociating from podcast movement including canceling our 2023 sponsorship plans. Meanwhile, the Daily Wire co-CEO Jeremy Boring states, I'm glad to see our longtime partner Cumulus Westwood One taking such a strong and public stand against podcast movements outright and abject bigotry. Though podcast movement quietly removed their bigoted tweet thread over the weekend, they still have yet to retract and publicly apologize for their hateful comments about Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire. In an illiberal moment, such as the one we are currently living in, if we don't stand up to this kind of bigoted behavior, it's only going to get worse. I certainly hope Cumulus's strong response to podcast movement is the first of many others like it. And so the fact that that big a company, which I'm sure has lots of woke employees, which I'm sure has a huge HR department with lots of whiny people in it, mm-hmm. uh, was able to take that step and do make that decision to do that without fear from their own internal employees and the backlash that would ensue, because I'm sure they got internal backlash. You've worked at big media companies. Mm-hmm. Don't you think there's a lot of woke people in the corporate offices? Of course. of course. So I'm sure that even though Ben Shapiro is an incredibly successful podcaster and that the Daily Partner, Daily Caller partnership is very lucrative for them, I'm sure that it was not uh, without controversy within their own building. The to Slack take that channel was, was obviously blowing up. People were like, oh, my God. I feel victimized. Right. So... The fact that they took that step and went so far as to cancel their sponsorship of the podcast movement thing, I think is really, really positive. This stuff needs to be nipped in the bud. Mm-hmm. We can't just let the whiniest, craziest person you in the room. butt or bud? Nip it in the bud. Jesus. Condescend to me. What? Nip it in the bud. What? I'm not condescending. What? What's the question? You need to nip your attitude in the butt. <laughs> you don't nip anything in the butt. You nip it in the bud. Um, so I think that it's really positive. You can't let the craziest person in the room have veto power over everything you do because you'll never get anywhere or move forward. All right. Now, there's a story I do like, okay? Okay. And I'm going to end on this. Do you have more? No, I'm all set. Okay. Well, we have the chat chat. Two messages, I think. So, themed food, a Virginia restaurant apologizes for 9-11 themed food menu that included Flight 93 redirect and Pentagon pie. 
<laughs> so I am what? here to say that I like a mind that thinks like this. <laughs> what? I like a mind that takes a walk, has a thought, a tiny inkling, and says, wait a second. I think I'm on to something. This has got to be a really small operation. A country right? club, there's a huge country club. The country club in Virginia has issued an apology for planning a 9-11 themed menu for this year's commemoration of September 11th terrorist attacks. A decision that garnered heavy criticism online. The special seafood menu promoted by the clubhouse in Aquia Harbor included dishes such as Flight 93 Redirect, First Responder Flatbread, and Pentagon Pie. <laughs> Among others, the menu was taken down, according to WJLA, but the image has been shared across social media. Freedom Flounder, 9-11 Oysters with Chipotle Remoulade. That's fun. The Remember Teeny, which is a 9-11 martini. This is great. The Never Forget Sampler is Pentagon Pie. The menu was not well received, with one Twitter calling the idea behind abhorrent. Uh, another Twitter questioned how an idea like this even gets that far. Some but you holidays know you don't celebrate with a theme party. You just don't. Well, George White, the restaurant's manager, shared an apology to the community's Facebook page Tuesday, saying his intention was to bring attention to that horrific day 21 years ago. And he meant to honor those who lost uh, so much, as well as those who gave everything. Restaurants also altered his menus to reflect this first Sunday of the NFL. The thing is, though, is that, you know, if you have somebody who's the marketing manager or even the, the sh who's only 30 years old, then you were 10 and 9-11 came. I have no clue. But this was especially. Somebody who's calibrated this way, There's that's a talent that should be harnessed for something. Because <laughs> that is incredible. Is, that, is this worse or not as bad as the person who put the sports team logos on the 9-11 on the, oh, that on the was memorial great too. on the on the like that, logo on the, on the TV, in a reflecting pool in the where, reflecting where tower pool. number two was where, yeah oh that was beautiful too oh. i'm all for it alice time has I passed think... i want to see people mishandle this memory as uh you know as brutally as soon possible it's gonna only soon like we'll be old and it's gonna be only the crotchety old people and the young people are all gonna be celebrating it with themed cocktails and yeah we're gonna be like the cranky old people on memorial day who say it's like inappropriate to have a barbecue on memorial day because it's for people who lost their lives like we'll, we'll be out of touch soon well, they'll be the drinking, young people they'll be drinking remember teenies <laughs> exactly they will Jesus. be drinking remember teenies and they'll have reflecting pool decor they're gonna <laughs> okay we got a couple of messages in the chat chat are you ready okay Hello, Tom. It's me, the Queen. What? My demise has been quietly embellished. I am here really? in, in Hawaii with my friend who flies around a helicopter. All right. Bye. Wait a second. Who's that? TC? Is that what that is? My friend who flies around the helicopter? Is that true? Alice, this is a, a big deal. Queen of England is in Hawaii. Also a place that was colonized, by the way. Not surprisingly, she should be attracted to that place. Mm -hmm. We wow. should give it back. Hey, Tom. This yeah. is Doug Henning. Doug Henning? The, is that the... Oh, the magician? I Doug Henning? Doug Henning is. Damn. World famous magician. Jesus. He was world famous in 1982. He had a, a ridiculous curly hair and mustache. What's that behind your ear? It's a quarter. What's that under your nose? Another quarter. Please, please, hold your applause. Now I'm about to saw a woman in half. In retrospect, that may have been a waste of time, but I'm <laughs> happy that Doug Henning was brought up anyway. Anytime that uh, that, that can happen, I am uh, I have no problemo, Alice. Oh, frig. Is the apple working now? Okay, so episodes... Uh... Yeah, but they manually did it, so they still don't know what the problem is. But it's affecting other people too who use. Yeah, SoundCloud. so we're still missing one episode five ninety one. I'm gonna ask them to manually get five ninety one and this current one up as well, and then we'll see if between SoundCloud and Apple they can get it figured out by Sunday, hopefully. Thank you so much for listening. As always, those of you who don't listen on Apple Podcasts, burn so, in hell. And so, oh no, I mean. You listen elsewhere. Sorry. Sorry, I stepped on you. <laughs> because you were saying important stuff. Um, who are still listening to us. We appreciate you. 
And uh, you can, as always, see us on YouTube, on Rumble. You can find us on all the other podcast apps or on social media at Burn Barrel Pod. The Freedom Flounder. Oh, no. 